let me uh, tell you a little story about you know, during my not so good old days before I became a Christian. Um, my dear friend, uh, he had this roommate named Bernie. Say Bernie was, say Bernie was a character. Was to say that mm, the Atlantic Ocean is a body of water. Uh, it's, it's just not enough to do it justice. One one weekend, we went up to Penn State to see the Pitt Penn State game. I believe this is back in '99. Um, and on the way home, Bernie was just obnoxiously, arrogantly, bel belligerently drunk, and and him and his family, him and his like dad and his uncle, they they, they bought up all this this property in, in this just slum town in, in Pittsburgh. I, I don't want to actually name it, but for purposes of just saying it's that's not its real name. We'll call it Hazelton, and uh, it's not actually called Hazelton, and. He's drunk out of his mind, and he's just arrogantly going on about how rich and powerful he's going to be someday. Now, this, this town, it, it was never a booming town in the first place. They're expecting it's going to be, like, the next, you know, sleeper boom town, so let's buy up property as fast as we can. This is 11 years ago. Hazleton is still not a very nice neck of the woods. And he's going on, he's, he's saying, like, ah, me and my old man, we're going to be rich. You know, we own all that property in Hazelwood. This is beautiful. And he's going on. He's like, "My, you own thirty houses. You're gonna be a millionaire." My dad's on the way to owning one third of Hazelwood. He, he's almost got thirty houses. In. He's just about a millionaire, and I'm gonna be a millionaire too. To which my one other friend leans over to me in a bit of a high pitched voice. He's like, well, "There's only uh, ninety houses in Hazelton." So. Anyway, he's just making a complete fool of himself. And and my friend, who was his roommate. It's just kind of putting his head down. And he told me later, he's thinking to himself, he's like, Bernie, shut up, man. You're making a fool of yourself. Just knock this off. You, you, you're just coming across as a complete jackass. So, what does this have to do with apostolic tradition? Unwritten apostolic tradition, separate from scripture specifically. Well, don't worry. Good old MSM will find a way to tie this all in. Kind of like the way he found a way to tie in a wrestling story with uh, John 17.3. You're not John 17.3, John 17.3, 3, John, uh, 3, 3, being born again. Don't worry, you're in good hands. Um, what this has to do with unwritten apostolic tradition separate from Scripture? Um, Irenaeus, and I love Irenaeus, there's basically a part in Against Heresies where I feel like my friend with Bernie kind of putting my head down and saying, stop, Irenaeus, stop, you are making a fool of yourself, please, that's enough. Irenaeus was uh, rebuking a heresy that Jesus only had a one-year uh, teaching ministry. And, no, he didn't have a one-year teaching ministry, but uh, let's hear what Irenaeus said of Jesus' teaching ministry. Um, he preached only one year reckoning from his baptism. On completing his 30th year he suffered, in fact, a young man by no means attained advanced age. Now, this is what the heretics are saying. As the first stage of early life embraces 30 years, and this extends onward to the 40th year, everyone will admit, from the 40th to 50th year, a man begins to decline towards old age, which our Lord possessed while he still fulfilled the office of a teacher, even as the gospel and the elders testify. Now, listen to that. Irenaeus is saying that Jesus was like 50 when he died. Those who were uh, conversant in Asia with John, the disciple of the Lord, affirming that John conveyed to them that information. So he's saying there's people around who, who knew John from back in the day. And these people are saying, yeah, we got this info from John that, uh, that Jesus was like in his early 50s when he died. Um, some, moreover, not only saw John, but other apostles too and heard the same account. Uh, from them and bear testimony to the validity of the statement. And besides this, the very Jews, well, he goes on, he's basically saying there, there's people who knew apostles left and right, who knew John, and they all, they're, they're all going to tell you that Jesus was 50 when he died. Stop, Irenaeus, that's enough. That, 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 that's enough, really. And he goes on to say that the Jews, you know, said to him in John 8, you're not even 50 years old. And Irenaeus is saying, well, Gee, is this something you'd say to a person who was under 40? No, you'd say you're not even 40 years old. So, Irenaeus and, and, those, and his friends obviously got their wires crossed badly uh, as far as how this information got conveyed to them. Um, this, you know, it's, it's a very, not a very neat, you know, it shows that when you pass doctrines down orally, 
and you don't also have them written down, it's real easy to get them screwed up. Um, now, that's not just the only thing I want to talk about here. Uh, I want to talk about the church father Papias, or Papias, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced. There's no extant uh, manuscripts of his work, but there's some fragments in, in uh, Eusebius in his church history. This is Book 3, Chapter 39. Uh, verses 11 and 12, it talks about some of the stuff you, that Eusebius talks about, some of the stuff Papias talks about. So the same writer also gives account which came to him through an unwritten tradition, certain strange parables and teachings of the Savior and other mythical things. Uh, to these belong his statement that there will be a period of some thousand years after the resurrection of the dead, the kingdom of Christ will be set up on material form of this earth. I suppose he got these ideas through a misunderstanding of apostolic accounts, not perceiving things said uh, to, by them were spoken mythically in figures. Well, you know, a couple things here. Uh, Eusebius, Eusebius regarded uh, the parables and teachings of Jesus that Papias mentioned as strange, which is basically saying some, some weird stuff that I never heard of. So, granting that Eusebius actually had teachings of Christ that, you know, he was he had heard orally from John, let's say, and these these teachings were not inscripturated. Where are they now? Where were they in the, these, in, during Eusebius' time? They were gone. He had never heard of some of this stuff. And the, the Eusebius, for people wondering, he lived in yeah, the early 300s, maybe? Um, so again, what's the use of unwritten apostolic tradition that is separate from Scripture when it obviously can't be preserved? Uh, not done yet. I want to also talk about Oh, okay, and, and then the premillennialism thing. Um, you know, Roman Catholicism says premillennialism can't be safely taught. Uh, Eastern Orthodoxy basically regards it as heresy. Yet you have a guy who the apostle, you know, knew the apostles, knew, knew John, and he's saying that he got that information basically from John. And Eusebius arrogantly dismisses it, saying, "Oh, he must have misunderstood that." Well, Eusebius, did you learn from a, from an apostle? Um, obviously, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy would say he, under, he misunderstood it, too. So, again, you have someone who was taught directly by an apostle of things, and then you, you know, have uh, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy saying he misunderstood the stuff he was taught. Well, what good is un, you know, written apostolic tradition that's orally handed down if it can be so easily misunderstood? Is it not possible that some of the doctrines taught today... Um, like veneration of images and Mary's bodily assumption into heaven. Were these not misunderstandings, perhaps, too, of oral apostolic tradition? Or worse, were they one generation's speculations that became the next generation's doctrines that became a later generation's dogma? Perhaps. Um, one also talked about something else, about Irenaeus. He, too was a premillennialist. I'm not going to bore you with the quotes, but you can find them in uh, Against Heresies, Book 5, uh, Chapters 36, Paragraph 3, Book 5, Chapter 30, Paragraph 4. Definite premillennialist. And he's two putts away from John himself as well. We're going to have Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism say, nah, Irenaeus obviously misunderstood him. Well, again, what's the use of having this if they can be so easily misunderstood? Or he disagreed with them even worse. Um... That's not good either. Uh, here's another big whammy from Irenaeus. Uh, he talks about what happens during uh, the Eucharist. He said, For the bread which is produced from the earth when it receives its invocation of God is no longer common bread but the Eucharist, consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly. So also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corrupt corruptible, having the hope of a resurrection to eternity. This is against heresies, uh, book 4, chapter 18, verse 5. Now, he said it has... Two, it has two natures, two elements, earthly and heavenly. Roman Catholicism flatly denies with its dogma of, of transubstantiation that there is any earthly element of the Eucharist. Um, it, is, it is the body of Christ just appearing in bread. So, did Irenaeus misunderstand that doctrine too? Um, and, you know, a Lutheran could say he was teaching consubstantiation, a, a, a symbolic... Uh, uh, the person would say that he was saying it was special bread because it represented the body of Christ. The Presbyterian might have his own say what Irenaeus meant, but it couldn't mean transubstantiation. So do you see why I'm a little hesitant to trust the claims of Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy about unwritten apostolic tradition?